So we already talked about objectivity in a previous lecture and there we connected it to the notion of a perspective. In this lecture, I want to run once again through the idea of objectivity, uh, several ways of thinking about the idea of objectivity. And specifically, what I want to do is I want to think about the relation between objectivity and the subject. And so in a traditional way of thinking about objectivity, the subject, one could say, is seen as the hurdle or enemy even to objectivity, right? There's objectivity and there is subjectivity. And so in order to get to objectivity, what you need to do is you need to remove the subject. Now, of course, you can't completely remove the subject. If I am supposed to have objective knowledge, well, I am supposed to have objective knowledge and I am a subject, right? If you take away me, I'm not going to be there to have objective knowledge. So we have to explain in what sense the subject has to be removed. Now, we already met one model of that in this Cartesian way of thinking about perception and properties. So according to, Cartes uh, to Cartesian philosophy, but also to a lot of other philosophers, including Locke in the 17th and 18th century, um, and maybe, in fact, also to some philosophers today, it makes sense to distinguish between like the primary objective qualities that objects themselves have. So they're objective in the sense that the objects alone have them. And then there are the secondary qualities, which are subjective in the sense that they are about relations that we subjects have to the objects. And so that an object is a certain size or a certain weight is for Descartes and Locke supposed to be an objective property. That's what the object itself has. That it is green or sweet. Well, that's about how we experience it, right? There's a subjective element to that. And so if you want to do science, we probably need to take that subjective element out. That's very true in uh, Cartesian science, right? The way that Descartes tries to do physics is he focuses only on what he thinks are the primary properties of size and shape and motion. So that's one way of thinking about objectivity, right? Objective knowledge is knowledge of the objective properties. The properties have that, that have nothing to do with us. Maybe we don't want to put properties so central, right? We want to think about objective knowledge in general, like there are all kinds of things we can know. Uh, maybe we can't always spell it out in terms of which properties we are trying to know. Here's one way we could, we could think about objective versus subjective, right? We could point out that certain facts in the world are clearly subjective. So here I have two pens. One is red and one is blue. And the red one is to the left of the blue one. For me, right? But if somebody is standing on the other side of my desk, uh, or maybe for you, depending on how these videos are mirrored or not, um, so for me, the red is to the left of the blue, but for somebody else, the blue might be to the left of the red. And that would be equally true. I mean, these are clearly subjective facts. They're only there from a certain perspective. We need to get rid of them. And that's fairly easy, right? Left and right, not a big philosophical problem about that, at least not in this context. But there might be other properties, maybe properties that have to do with whether something is is nice or good or valuable um, and who knows what else that perhaps are only there for subjects that are only there from a particular point of view and so we might have the idea that to be objective what we need is we need not to take in any specific point of view right i mean not my point of view not your point of view not anyone's point of view to be objective is to have the view from nowhere that's the title of a very fine book by uh, Thomas Nagel, The View From Nowhere. But that would be the idea, right? I mean, God's point of view is also sometimes used, but that sounds a little bit like a perspective, God's perspective. Well, you know, it's supposed to be not a perspective. The view from nowhere, the completely objective description of the world. So maybe that's what we have to seek for. And one problem with that is that it's a little bit hard to know what it is. I mean, and how do we know that we are there, right? You get into the kind of trouble that we saw when we thought through the dialectic of perspectivism. If the very fact that something 
uh, looks a certain way or seems to be a certain way from our perspective is enough to undermine it, then it's hard to see what is left, right? I mean, how are we going to attain this view from nowhere? Now, I'm not saying that philosophers like Nagel are in any way naive about that because they are not, uh, but there are certainly some philosophical questions there. How do we get to the view from nowhere? Why do we even want to get to the view from nowhere? Maybe that's also a question we could ask. Anyway, that's another way of thinking about objectivity. It is to get rid of all the subjective points of view and instead take up the point of view from nowhere. Here's a final way of thinking about objectivity that I want to mention uh, that's in the same vein, right? The vein where we try to take the subject away in order that we are left with the object. And this third way of trying to do that says, look, what is really subjective are values, right? I mean, in the objective world, there are things with properties, but there are no values. Nothing is good or bad or useful or useless. That's only our subjective point of view. So what we could think is that in order to attain objective knowledge, we've got to take away all the values, right? We've got to look at the world with our values turned off, so to speak. Uh, maybe not our epistemic values, right? I mean, maybe it's nice if as investigators of the world, we try to be consistent and coherent and so on, but our ethical and political values, right? We need to turn those off if we want to get an objective view of the world. And so what we would then attain is what is often called the value-free ideal of science, right? And so science would be good if it incorporates no values or at least no non-epistemic values. So the real scientist is somebody who is in no way ethical or political, but just looking at the objects, right? And again, that's a way of thinking about objectivity where somehow we have to take the subject out in order to get to the objective. And the value-free ideal has come under a lot of scrutiny and a lot of criticism in the past decades, uh, in part because it seems to be extremely hard to pull off. I mean, how do you turn off your values? Um, but also because it maybe doesn't seem to be the kind of thing that we even want to pull off, right? I mean, as soon as I make a decision about what to investigate, I'm going to use values to do that, right? I mean, that's... The idea of a science that proceeds without values would seem to be the idea of a science that proceeds without caring about what it investigates. And it's very hard to make sense of such an ideal. It's very hard to see how a science without values could even proceed, could even get started. But after all, science is something that we do. It's something practical. To totally sever the link with practical rationality might be a lot harder than it sounds at first, uh, at first sound. Okay, so there are a couple of ways of thinking about objectivity that consist of, of pulling the subject out of it. Um, all of them are maybe defensible, but also all of them seem to run into certain kinds of trouble. It's not immediately clear that we can be objective in that sense, or that we would necessarily want to be objective in that sense. So maybe we should try to think about objectivity in a different way. And a different way of thinking about objectivity might be a way in which we don't try to take the subject out of the objective, but rather in which we try to put the subject into the objective, or to say it maybe a little bit more accurately, to put more subjects into something in order to get the objective. Right? What seems to be wrong about certain ways of approaching the world, what seems to make them subjective in a bad way, is that people limit themselves to their particular point of view, right? If I look at the world through a certain sort of narrow focus and I interpret things through that narrow focus and I say of everything else, you know, if, if I interpret everything through that focus and I don't listen to what other people are saying about that, uh, then we could say that I'm not really on the road to objective knowledge. Right? I'm only looking at things from my own subjective point of view. That would seem to be a bad thing. So maybe the resolution is not so much to take me out of that, but it's to put other people into that, right? to require me to talk to other people 
to listen to other people, to take up other perspectives, to compare, compare them, to combine them, and so on and so forth. And so there's been a lot of work on that in, uh, in the philosophy of science, uh, especially in social epistemology and feminist epistemology. Uh, here is something that, um, that the philosopher Helen Longino tells us. So Longino, and she's talking about scientific communities. What she says is that, you know, among the things that a scientific community needs to be in order for this community to generate objective knowledge, right? So these are conditions on objectivity, um, is well, first of all, that community needs to have avenues for criticism, right? If people put their ideas out there, there should be ways for other scientists to criticize those ideas. So maybe through peer review, maybe through critical articles and so on. Also, the group of scientists, the scientific community should be such that there's an uptake of criticism. That if people, you know, give criticism, uh, that sometimes this has an effect, right? That maybe ideas get rejected or changed. So we need criticism and we need an uptake of criticism. And what we need, third thing that uh, Longino mentions, and I'm not telling our entire story, but these are, these are three things that I think are especially important for us to focus on. So the third thing that she mentions is there should be a kind of equality, a kind of equality in epistemic authority, right? There should not be uh, one or maybe a few gurus who tell everybody what to think. I mean, that's not the right way to attain objectivity. No, everybody, at least everybody who is sort of qualified, who has studied these things, uh, everybody should be, you know, treated equally. We should look at their arguments. We should look at their data. We shouldn't be looking at who they are and whether they are the local guru or something, someone like that. So if we have those three things, and maybe a couple of more, but these are three very important ones. If we have avenues for criticism, if there's an actual uptake of that criticism, so that criticism can have actual effects, and if everybody is allowed to play a role in, in criticizing and uh, thinking about the criticism and changing the science and so on, if there's that kind of equality, then we have a scientific community that can produce objective knowledge rather than merely subjective knowledge. So that's the way that Longino thinks about this. And as we see, it's a very social epistemological way of thinking about it, right? To be objective is to interact with other people in a certain way. It is to make sure that you don't get stuck in one way of viewing things, but that you actively maybe search out other ways of thinking in order to compare and possibly combine them into an ever better view of the world. And while Longino develops these ideas specifically for science, I think they are probably just as applicable outside of science, right? If you want to, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, think about some some proposal in, in local politics, like should we close this road for cars or not? Uh, probably a good way to, to, you know, get insight into that that is objective is not to remain in your own maybe narrow view. Like, no, I want to drive there to get to my work as fast as possible. Or no, I'm, I get sick and tired of seeing cars driving here. Let's kick them out. Um, it's to, you know, talk to different people, get these perspectives together, see what the, um, what different people use it for, what different people want, what all the, all the values and ideas are, and, you know, maybe not reach a perfect consensus, but at least weigh everything in developing a point of view on the issue. So that seems to make a lot of sense in science, in politics, in many other areas besides. One worry that one might have about this type of proposal is that it would lead to a kind of both sidesism, right? Where you say, oh, look, well, there are the people who think this and there are the people who think something else. And now we have to find some kind of in the middle position, right? So there are the scientists who say that the world is round and there are the flat earth people. And now we have to sort of combine those perspectives and get something that's in between them. Um, and so on, right? For whatever controversial topic you might want to uh, want to bring in, I don't think that this way of thinking about objectivity necessarily leads to that, right? I mean, 
um, being open to other people's perspectives and being willing to compare and possibly combine different ways of viewing things doesn't mean that we attach equal value to everybody's ideas, right? If somebody has really investigated things and thought about things, and if somebody themselves is willing to listen to others and give arguments and consider other people's arguments and so on, well, that makes their point of view more valuable. If somebody has an idée fixe, right? I mean, they're completely fixated on a certain idea and they don't listen to any counter arguments, then their point of view is probably not going to turn out to carry a lot of weight in the kind of comparison that we have to do. So it's not the case that if you think about objectivity as bringing in many subjects, that you are thereby committing yourself to um, searching out perfect consensus or searching a view in the middle or uh, giving equal weight to both groups or giving equal weight to people with very extreme positions or something like that. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything is going to depend on what the criteria for comparison and evaluation and combination are. Of course, that also means that there's a lot of work to be done, right? And if you want to defend uh, an account of objectivity like this, you've got to tell us more about how we evaluate and compare and combine points of view, right? You have to tell us more about that. That's some of the work that has to be done here. Um, so it's a story that I personally think is a, a lot more promising than the idea of objectivity that consists of taking out the subject. I just don't think that that's possible. Um, I don't even think it really makes sense as an ideal. Um, so I really like this view of objectivity as bringing in more subjects, but it's a view of objectivity that raises a lot of questions, like how to do that. How are we going to weigh different ideas against each other? How are we going to bring people into contact in such a way that, um, that it's actually going to be fruitful, for instance, rather than just people talking past each other or screaming at each other? So there's a lot of work to be done there for social kinds of epistemology, but also outside of epistemology, right? For thinking about how to, how to treat people, how to organize society, education, journalism, and so on. Um, yeah, so that's what I wanted to say about objectivity, and I hope to see you for our next topic.